<laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a huge pleasure to welcome you to Telesians tonight. Um, it's really great to see you all. Uh, it's a privilege to, to be able to welcome you here today. Um, just some news, we've just come back from uh, Lisbon, where we took part in Quant Mines, what used to be called Global Derivatives, so I delivered some talks there. And uh, along the way, we started a Telesian chapter in Lisbon. We gave the first Telesian talk in Lisbon, and we hope that these talks will continue, um, but, and, 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 and the chapter will be run um, by our local organizers in, 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 in Lisbon. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to mention them uh, today. Uh, Marcus Carreira and Rafael Sequeira will be our contacts in, in, in Lisbon and, and running, running our talks, Talesian talks there. And we hope to take our trainings to Lisbon as well. Also, we were going back through Paris and we started a Talesian chapter in Paris. Um, Paulus Jacobenus is going to be running the Talesians in Paris. And we very much hope that um, in these two very exciting locations, Telesians will um, will um, will develop you know, from strength to strength. Um, it is a special pleasure um, to before we introduce our our distinguished speaker today. It's a special pleasure to ask our sponsor, who is supplying the drinks and food, um, is uh, the founder of Tequila, and we see. In fact, you're standing in front. Our, oh, I'm sorry. Our, our <laughs> <most of it. laughs> but now I'm standing in front of this project. No, I think so. Okay, but you can you can point to the tequila uh, billboard, and maybe you can say a few words about what you do, and then I'll I'll I'll. I'll yes, I'll well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, yes, my name is Tuomas Eerola. Uh, I work as well. It's always great to come to London when people are doing this thing. So I am coming more often here. Yeah. So um, I work for for Tequila Technologies, and and uh, I have been coming to these events whenever possible. Uh, these are really great events, and I really appreciate this work that uh, that Paul and and Syed and all the Thalation community are doing. Um, Personally, I know that uh, I am in so much better mood when I have, like, you know, a glass of something in my hands or or a small snack, and that's why I said to Paul that, hey, like, you know, would be some would it be somehow possible to show, like, you know, our appreciation? And Paul said that, yeah, well, that that drink and, and, and sandwich or snack concept sounds good, and and uh, um, that's how we ended up in this cooperation. So Thalesians are supplying great uh, great talks and and. Uh, we are hopefully being able to contribute with with uh, great drinks and snacks. So what this tequila thing is, this is a so-called next generation compute grid. And uh, what makes this next generation is that uh, um, one of the quants in, in Lisbon, when he was uh, talking about uh, his studies, he said that tequila is actually a pretty phenomenal thing because it provides abstraction that simplifies the use of compute infrastructures so that uh, he doesn't need to like play with the computer systems. He said that unlike many other products, this has the unique feature that this really works. And that's a very good feature. So uh, without further ado, um, I came here to listen to Dr. Borokova, not, uh, not to my own, own voice. So I want to like uh, hand it over to Svetlana. But, uh, but uh, if any one of you would like to try to do like you know some kind of like uh, research and, and, and developments where you would benefit from faster like experimentations, just like grab my hand and say that hey can I give a try and let's organize that thing. So one of the amazing thing I know about your platform is that uh, you're not just uh, applying um, the grid. First of all, it's extremely easy to use, right? And it gives you the speed up, especially mm -hmm. for free. Right, especially for, um, for problems which are, you know, embarrassingly parallel, it's a very, very quick way to solve them extremely quickly. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, um, we we have the library, the TSA library. We hope to um, start integrating your platform, maybe with with, with with the library. I mean, it is a commercial product, but I think it's 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 definitely worth it. 
So uh, just wanted to mention that um, I know that you are doing it not just in finance, but also in cancer research, for example. You have some amazing applications where this provides a very, very significant speed up in these extremely important areas. Okay, since you said that I need to brag, there, there was a, a, a breast cancer researcher who had this massive data set where he wanted to do a combinatory anal analytical problem, and he said that if he would have run that with his existing infrastructure, it would have taken 14 and a half years to go through, through that data set. And obviously that's out of question because the researcher would have run out of research grants by that time, and that's very inconvenient. Uh, so he contacted us, and uh, because we are not hiring computers, we just offer the technology, then we decided together to contact Microsoft and say that, hey guys, you have this cloud thing, so, uh, would you be interested in doing this kind of showcase, what everything you can do with cloud? And now the guy had his uh, analytical algorithms written in MATLAB. Our technology plugs directly into his MATLAB and he was able to fire up, was it uh, 2500 uh, processors or something like that in, in, in Microsoft and, uh, and get the whole job done in just four days. And uh, I know that you are mathematicians, but I just want to emphasize that four days is radically faster than 14 and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but hey, without further ado, so shall we? And it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Vitlana Barovkova, a distinguished academic from VU Amsterdam, who has made fundamental contributions to, uh, the, uh, to quantitative finance in general. But now uh, she will talk about new um, applications, new results that she has in, in, in other extremely exciting and extremely topical areas. Now, I'm not going to go through your academic CV because it's, it's vast it's and it's, it's online <laughs> and, uh, and I'm probably not worthy to actually recite it. So what, uh, what, what we'll, we'll say is that it's extremely topical, new sentiment and AI. Please welcome to the yeah, thank you. Um, you have oh yeah, I just, I just Press the button. Uh, or, I, or I can do it if you want. I, I no, no, can, it's I, okay. I can just. Um, no, is it, is no, it better no, if I do it or no? Okay, so welcome. Thank you so much for coming and for this wonderful introduction. Um, yes, indeed, I am a, a professor of quant finance and risk management at uh, this stands for Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, Free University of Amsterdam. And I'm also a partner and head of quant modeling in an advisory firm called Probability. And uh, there we uh, advise uh, financial institutions about uh, risk, but also uh, uh, other financial and non-financial institutions in the area of machine learning, in the area of data analytics, and so on. So it's, uh, I have two heads, one academic and one very much practitioner-oriented. And uh, in everything I do academically, practical uh, aspects uh, play an important role. And in everything I in, in everything I do uh, for my advisory function, I uh, rely on uh, content, on fundamental understanding of uh, phenomenon at hand, and in a the modern way of uh, dealing with the problem. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, news analytics. So here you can also see the social media uh, words, but uh, it's. Actually, I'm not going to talk that much about that, uh, I, and I will explain in a minute also why. But the predominantly, I will talk about news analytics and news sentiment and uh, it myriad of applications that it has in finance. I'm not going to talk about applications that other people do, but only which our group does. And by our group, I mean both our research group at the university and also my uh, team. And uh, so, so uh, just a couple of words about how I came to that. Um, as Paul uh, said, I'm a quant for 20 years uh, plus, and uh, very much coming from stochastic processes, time series, econometrics, chaotic time series, machine learning when nobody knew about it. Um, but I always uh, felt, so, so price uh, analytics, modeling of prices of financial assets was always a very interesting topic for me. And I always felt that something was missing, and what was missing was external information. So as you can imagine, back in the 90s or early 2000s, your models would be pretty much what we call closed form, right? So you look at the past and you try to predict the future, let's say, or um, you... Um, uh, um, 
try to come up with some mathematical model, but no external information was participating in these models. And I always felt it was a huge, uh, huge barrier of actual success in explaining asset prices. And then I remember attending a conference on uh, sentiment analysis, uh, I think it was 2011, so pretty early on. And um, uh, Rich Brown, who was the head of uh, uh, news analytics of Thomson Reuters was giving a presentation about their uh, data that they uh, developed, their news analytics engine, and I thought, yes, this is what I was looking for for so long, and finally I found it. So I grabbed him, of course, in the break and said, look, I want to use the, this data, and how can we do it? So we had a research collaboration agreement, and very quickly, um, me and my group uh, developed ourselves as the group that knew something about this particular uh, field. And uh, so from some point on, they actually uh, appointed me a preferred consultant in the area of news analytics. And my job is basically to take their data, and there are many different forms and shapes of it, and think of new interesting applications of it. Practical, interesting for companies, for for uh, investment, uh, trading, uh, risk, and everything else. That's, uh, of course, extremely exciting. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about a few of those applications. And these are not all, because I was just before the lecture, I was discussing with one of the uh, guests uh, about some other application, and uh, that's the one that I didn't have time to include in the presentation. But if you want to know more, afterwards or uh, give me a call and I'll tell you more. But uh, so, so well, this is a little bit the outline. So we're going to look at the commodity markets. That's where I basically come from. I was actually, uh, I worked in London for a couple of years. I was a uh, uh, trading analyst for Shell trading, uh, oil trading. So uh, my background is very much, uh, practical background is very much in commodity, especially energy markets. But then we're going to talk about uh, stock markets, uh, and from that we we will go through to a very interesting application of uh, sentiment analysis, and that's systemic risk of the financial system. From that we're going to smoothly go to sort of creating uh, new sentiment indices and how they can be used, and for for example for sector rotation strategies. But this is just a small part of things that we have done or are doing uh, with this uh, new sentiment for, for finance. Okay, so w w what is the motivation? Well, news drives the markets, that there is no question about it. So, of course, there is uh, uh, in, uh, microstructure noise, the trading itself moves prices, but fundamentally it's the news, it's an external information that drives asset prices. So, for example, Typical example, lawsuit says General Motors hit ignition defect in recalled cars. So this hits uh, Reuters Newswire or Bloomberg and you see the drop in the share price. Yeah, So they don't have to be a rocket scientist to have this you know, very, very uh, direct causal relationship. Well, another classical example of media-driven, let's say, event is the bank run. Right? Imagine you have a substantial amount of money in a bank and you hear on the news that your bank is in trouble. So your rational response would be to go and start shifting your money elsewhere. Right? That's exactly what hundreds of others will do. And by depriving the bank of the liquidity, by de taking your assets away, you actually bring the bank into trouble. While in the beginning the, the news could have been false and nothing really fundamentally wrong was with the bank in the first place. But that doesn't matter whether it was or it wasn't. The fact that media drives actions and that actions cause the distress is, uh, is, a, is a classic example of uh, sort of media not just reflecting on some sort of fundamentals of flow of new information, but in fact causing asset prices to move. Another example is of course from uh, one and a half years back when nothing happened to the, uh, no, no, nobody did or said anything that was new. It's just that some website reprinted some old remarks of, 
of Prime Minister and uh, pound dropped sharply simply on the basis of stale news which was not even new anymore. Yeah? So again, media-driven uh, distress, media-driven events show us that financial rise, markets rise and fall on sentiment more even than the facts, let alone the fact that the sentiment and news reflect the fact, but even if they don't, it's still media is the major uh, driven uh, driver of uh, asset prices. So uh, since uh, I started in this area in 2011, uh, we see wider and wider adoption of, uh, of uh, using news, using sentiment, using social media for things like algorithmic trading, for uh, quant investing, for um, assessment of risk and so on. Yeah? So first ones to do it were hedge funds, quantitative hedge funds, but now you see it also spreading into more sort of traditional financial institutions. But not really to the extent that, um, that it should be, in my opinion. Um, especially because the algorithm, uh, artificial intelligence tools to, to read and process news uh, automatically are available. And uh, they are usually natural language uh, processing tools, which are based on some dictionaries, on text parsing, on machine learning, and many other clever clever things when so, so an engine would read news and tell what it's about and what's the tone of it. Is it positive, negative, or, or, or not, something in between? And uh, companies do offer those news analytics uh, capabilities uh, in the form of uh, feeds, quantitative feeds. Um, for example, Thomson Reuters, with whose data I worked for so long, but also Ravenpack is another major player in this field. Bloomberg has uh, uh, also incorporated sentiment in the Bloomberg terminal. IBM, the blue, uh, what's it called, blue, blue something, you know, the, the big computer. They also uh, crunch uh, news in real time. And of course, many other uh, companies, which are usually smaller, are also doing it for social media, so they crawl the web and collect <coughs> information and try to interpret it or not. But uh, one of the examples is, of course, stock tweets. Uh, so yeah, all this gave rise to sentiment-based algo trading in equity, foreign exchange, uh, also commodities, and also in the secondary markets of these assets, like options and ETFs and so on. So the news uh, sentiment engines, as I said, there are available, you know, many. You can write your own if you want. I wouldn't recommend it, but, uh, uh, you know, high quality ones are available. And so one of them is, for example, the Thomson Reuters News Analytics. So it's, uh, it's exactly that kind of engine which reads and interprets all the news that hit the Thomson Reuters uh, uh, newswire. So co news companies such as Bloomberg and Reuters are of course in unique position to do this because they are sitting on that fire hose of all the news that hits their newswires. They have the army of editors with huge expertise and so they are in a unique position to combine all that and put the um, natural language processing artificial intelligence on top of that. So that's one of the examples of that. So it scans uh, many news sources in real time, but it also does it for social media. And each news item is tagged for a specific asset. It could be a commodity and it could be a stock. And the stock's uh, universe is very large, all commodities are included. And so basically, the, instead of just text of a news item or a news alert, it provides a whole bunch of numbers, which is quantitative information about each particular news item. So it's a hugely granular, yeah? so it's, it's item per item, not aggregated in any way. So it's as raw as it gets without being actually text, which is very nice because it means for me as a researcher, I can do all sorts of things with it. I can process it in the way I want and uh, dig very deep into that, looking for very interesting applications, which I will show you today. Uh, 
some of these uh, engines already process the data for you. They puree it in a sort of hourly or even daily frequency. So one of the offerings of Thomson Reuters is called market side indices, which does exactly that. But that's a black box. So you get something and you don't know how you got it. So I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, so basically, um, this is like eating, cooking with fresh vegetables. Yeah? And this is like eating pre-processed, pureed uh, food. So I'm, that's why I'm going to talk a little bit more today about this rather than um, those offerings which already offer you some sort of aggregated characteristics over a certain time period or over a certain universe, yeah? which is a lot of that is actually around. So, but as I said, you know, Thomson Reuters is not the only one that's providing this. Raden, Park, Bloomberg, they are all sort of active players in the field. So, but, but many things that they do are actually similar. So the, the engines that they use, how they train them is, is clearly uh, similar. The natural processing algorithms are well known and well developed. And the output is also pretty consistent across all these things. So for example, here, uh, the, each item would be assigned a ticker. So what is it about? And if a news item is about several, then it will feature several times. It's about Apple, Google, and Amazon. So three tickers will be included. And then the relevance, which is how relevant a new, that news item is for the asset. And the most important is, of course, sentiment. And it's basically scores between zero and one that should be interpreted as the probability that the news item conveys sort of positive or negative outlook on the asset price. Yes, so that's how it should be interpreted. And then we also have uh, other characteristics such as novelty, how new this item is, uh, volume, how much has been written about this already before in the last uh, periods of time, the timestamp, of course, but many, many other things. Where does it come from? What's the headline, number of negative words, number of positive words, and so on and so forth. So loads of things. Whether it's alert or an article, that's also very important. Um, things, like, things like that. So a huge amount of quantitative characteristics referring to each and every item. So this is an example. So here would be, you know, the Facebook, Triple M, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Yahoo, Vodafone, and so on. So I just took a snapshot from this data set. So here is the relevance. You see, it's, if it's one, means it's purely about that particular asset, and otherwise it's kind of split into assets. And these are these very important um, uh, sentiment uh, characteristics. So clearly, here you see the very, very highly positive uh, message about Facebook, and so on. So you can actually scroll uh, to the right and, and see the, 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 the headline. So you can actually process the headline as well. So how did this whole area start? So the, uh, one of the pioneers of this uh, work before this stuff was a professor from Columbia University called Paul Tetlock. So he's, uh, he wrote two papers in 97, I think in 98, where he analyzed uh, news messages from Wall Street Journal also with natural language processing algorithms uh, written by his PhD students or research assistants. And he did it in a, by means of the so-called event study. An event is defined as a day which is overwhelmed, let's say, by a positive or negative news about a certain stock. And basically like a 10% uh, highest sentiment. Uh, that's what he defined as an event and since then this was actually like the first thing you do with the whole sentiment analysis. And this is pretty much the first picture that appeared in that whole area. So I think this is the only picture in my whole talk which is not generated by me personally. But it summarizes quite a lot of features here. So you see that this is the day which is uh, very much you know, in a sign of some positive or negative news. And this is the returns, community returns which are accompanying negative uh, and positive news. And you see that uh, the, the biggest price move is happens on the day of the, of the event. So you are basically too late if you 
just look at the closing press. And the same here. See, this is the just the look prior to the closing on the event day. That's when the all move comes. So this is this is pretty much what he what he showed. And um, and of course, you know, when you when you get all this data for the sentiment, that's probably one of the first things you would do. Okay? So um, that's what we did, for example, for commodities. So the commodities are interesting uh, animals because they are really driven by supply and demand, by geopolitical news, and so on and so forth. So it's really very much driven by news and information. On the other hand, there are also a lot of challenges. So for example, if about a certain stock, even a very liquid stock, and I'm going to show you some examples, you might have, I don't know, 40 news items a week. Yeah? That's a lot. Well, you know how many, on average, news items are there about crude oil per day? If it's a trading day, so Monday to Friday. It would be about 800 to 1,000. Yeah, so that's a huge volume of news for that one particular asset. So we need to aggregate it somehow. And when we thought about this aggregation, we actually come up with a model which is now pretty much the industry standard of uh, processing this data and not just for commodities but also for equities and, and I'm going to show it to you in a, in a minute. On the other hand also interpretation is very very difficult because for stocks if something sounds positive it's usually positive like Facebook <coughs> is posting a great results or Facebook is slaughtered in the US uh, parliament. Yes it first sound positive and second sound negative, and so the effect on the price is probably like that. Well, in commodities, it's of course completely not the case, because let's say a rig, big rig is, explodes. Huh? Sounds negative, casualties, you know. But for oil price, it's an upward pressure, right? So it's a positive news if you interpret it as outlook on that asset price. While something which is very positive, like peace in the Middle East and everybody loves each other in OPEC, sounds positive, but for the oil price, that's bad news, right? It's so, so interpretation is very difficult, and um, natural language processing algorithms usually struggle with this. So we actually assisted the uh, Thomson Reuters with this uh, interpretation by uh, pointing out and actually working out that for sentiment measures to work effectively, they have to correlate with supply and demand. So we have to clearly separate uh, supply and demand related news. And actually, in the latest version, it is also uh, actually separated that way. Um, right. So I won't go, to go into much detail, but we aggregate the sentiment over a day, waiting it. Uh, so this is not the model that I Man, this is just a simple aggregation where you aggregate weighing by relevance, weighing by novelty. So the relevant news get higher weighting, the novel news get higher weighting. You extend weekends back as one trading day, again with some exponentially decaying weights because people forget on Monday what happened on Saturday and so on. So, so you aggregate it, uh, it still um, is very, very noisy. Even when you aggregate it, it's still very... Uh, uh, noisy, but at least you can do these pictures. And this is the picture, remember that Tetlock picture for stocks? This is what it looks for, like for oil. See, it's a, it's a very different, uh, it's a very different story. Uh, also, of course, the biggest uh, price move is on the event day. That's not a big uh, surprise. But look at the asymmetry between positive and negative news. So here the credence that market gives to negative news is clearly much, much greater than uh, for stocks. Yeah, well, where it's pretty much symmetric. Right, so, so also he, there, you remember there was this move and then things were flat. So here there is a move and things basically persist for a long time. Okay, uh, especially on the downside. So this is for uh, futures, uh, for oil futures, and this is, for example, for natural gas. Yes. So yeah, see again, the downside is just awesome. Yeah. So that's just completely different than, than the stock situation, which is relatively symmetric. And we see it across the board. So here is copper, and uh, if you look at agriculture, it's the same pattern. 
So that's, that's very interesting. So somehow, you see, the bad news is just simply preys on people's mind, obviously, more than uh, bad it, it news. It sounds kind of, kind of natural when the negative news always impresses you more. Yeah, than but why is it not the case then for stocks? Why is it not such a huge asymmetry? Because we also looked at the same pictures with this data for stocks, and it, there is not this huge discrepancy between positive and negative. So somehow something is going on. Um, and uh, another thing that we noticed is that new sentiment is very much correlated with price momentum. And that is because a lot of what's written is about what happened to the price. So again, on our advice, the, uh, the price-related news is now kind of um, treated separately. Right? Oil went up 5% yesterday. This is clearly a not a news, right? It's a reflection on the past price trend. So it's momentum-related news. So what can you do with this? So, 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 so this is just like a tiny little thing which you do first. Let me just uh, mention, without showing pictures, other things that you can do. So for example, what you could do is you could uh, see how... So, so, so let's look at uh, natural gas. Natural gas is an interesting commodity because it's kind of... It's very volatile, and it's also kind of jumpy. It's oil, there is a big debate whether there are jumps in the price of oil or whether it is simply a very volatile sort of Brownian motion-like process. Well, with natural gas, and especially with electricity, there is no doubt that there are actual jumps occur because of whatever reasons. Natural gas is difficult to store, electricity is impossible to store at all. So what you could do is you could look at the price and you can try to separate the diffusion and the jump components. So there are statistical techniques. Uh, for example, Bandorf Nielsen uh, uh, wrote a lot about it, Shepard, about how to, if you have diffusion with jumps, how to separate those two components. It's possible to do. And, uh, and then you can basically look at when there is news, does that make sure there is a jump? Or, or not. So whether news affects volatility of the diffusion component or whether it affects the, the jumpiness of the asset, right? So what we found is that, well, non, non surprisingly, is that the jumps are strongly caused by news. So they are greatly caused uh, by, by, by news. And uh, while, for example, increased volatility actually causes news. So there is there are all sorts of interesting causality effects. And commodities are interesting beasts to analyze this kind of stuff because there is huge news flow, uh, very liquid assets, so interesting price features. Another thing you could do, and um, I'm also just going to mention it very briefly, and that you can do not just for uh, commodities but also for stocks. Um, people noticed already many years ago, so one of the first... Uh, to write about it was uh, Helen Giman, very famous uh, quant finance person and my co-author. So she and Anne had an article in Journal of Finance basically saying markets do not live in calendar time. They don't, one hour is not the same as another hour, right? One hour goes faster than, and another hour goes slow. The activity in financial markets does not go linearly with time. Um, and if you are able to find a proxy from this act for this activity and sample the prices according to this activity, not the calendar hour, but let's say activity hour, which sometimes could be 15 minutes, but sometimes could be two hours, then you could show that actually all this cortosis, so the heavy tails, pretty much disappear from the prices. Yeah? So, so that was very interesting. And, and of course, the big issue is what is the proxy of this activity? And people used all sorts of things like, like volume. But again, it's all derivative. So, so basically what we said, you know what? It's the news volume that's, uh, that determines the activity during trading hours. And so what uh, we, we model this activity throughout trading day or a week or whatever for commodities, because there are so many news, but now also for stocks, by means of this changing flow of news. And that looks very nice. So if you if you have any ideas of how to apply it, you know what would be an application of this, of the I would very much like to to hear it. So one thing we could think of is the order execution, is that if you have if you are executing a large institutional order 
then you should pay attention at this activity and split your world in ch into chunks according to this activity that you observe in the market. But we need to specify it further. Anyway, so Garch models the volatility forecasting, how uh, news affects uh, secondary markets, options, so all these are very interesting things to do. But of course, what you could also do, you could simply trade on this, right? You could, uh, you could go ahead and just, you know, take positions uh, on the base of it. So I'm going to show you a couple of things here. So, um, of course, how would you trade in a simple way? You would probably be, uh, look at some sort of momentum or moving average crossover, right? So typical technical analysis. So what we, what we do, is what, what, what if we now take these simple things and we augment it with sentiment? So for example, we can say we trade on momentum or let's say moving average crossover, but we only take those trades when it's also confirmed by the sentiment. So you have a moving average crossover, which indicates turn in the price, let's say it's the turn down, but you only short that asset if the sentiment that you currently observe is also negative. Yeah? So it gives you much fewer trades than a regular momentum of, or a moving average crossover and potentially it could improve. Uh, uh, well, this is very similar, only you're allowed to sort of build up positions and this is also very similar but only you, you do it on, only when the sentiment is really strong. So you really pick up only big moves uh, in this way. So how does that play out? Well, it turns out that plays out very well. And um, so here is the benchmark. That's just the regular, the non-argumented uh, strategy. And I think the, you see the risk characteristics are approximately the same, but the, but the returns are actually very, very good. So, so, um, so that's nice. Um, and, uh, and that's for crude oil, but you see it across the commodities. So, but this for individual commodities, this is still a lot of volatility. So now let's suppose we do it as a basket, right? We take some basket of commodities, so this is a hypothetical basket. It actually reflects a little bit of, of the, let's say, no, it doesn't. It's, it's very energy sort of based, yes? Yeah? So even more so than Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. And let's do it with that. So then you can see that actually it's, the volatility is actually very, very low and the profit is, very, is, is actually quite good. So you see the daily profit maximum is uh, six times more than the maximum loss. So you limit, significantly limit the downside by observing the sentiment. And I'm going to show it to you also on the example of stocks. So here you also have a good return. In the example of stocks, you keep the return but you decrease volatility a lot, yeah? Because you exit the market when there is a uh, change in sentiment. Yeah. Sorry, uh, how is it compared to the strategy without sentiment increased? Without the sentiment? Yes, yeah, so. Yeah, I don't have it on the slides, but... Um, because probably it's also a very nice one. I mean, uh, it's yeah, so, it so, so, so the, 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 bigger, the, biggest, the, the biggest gain that you have is the decrease in standard deviation and in the in the downside, I don't have it on the slides, but okay. we have it in the in the white paper. Um, yeah, so it's very good. Um, but of course, obviously, the more people start doing this, the more it will be arbitraged away. This kind of stuff, right? And I'm not sure whether um, you know a lot of people trade with it. I know of several companies in the Netherlands who actively trade commodity futures on the basis of sentiment together with these kind of similar approaches. They are not out of business yet, so um, some, they must be doing something. You can also do intraday trading. So we also checked how would it play out if you did it within the day, right? So where you could look at minute per minute uh, uh, news flow of five minutes. So it's not high frequency trading. It's kind of like a medium frequency, right? And that also, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an alpha generating uh, process that you, that you have. Now, what about stock related stuff? So again, for the stocks, you know, we can look at it in many, many different ways. And uh, people did so before and we did uh, as well. So one of the things that we uh, looked at is um, how if we, if we now trade on the basis of stock-specific sentiment, 
uh, how can we basically <coughs> improve it and optimize it? And it turns out that the one thing that you should look at is not only sentiment about a particular stock, but also how it compares to the, let's say, market-wide or industry-wide sentiment. Yeah? So, because some very positive news about some tech stock could be simply riding on the positive sentiment about all tech stocks, right? Which is also nice, and I'm going to show it to you with the sector rotation strategies. But if you want a stock picking, then it's important to put the sentiment about the stock next to sentiment about its peers. And if there is a discrepancy, that's when that is actually a valuable signal. And um, yeah, I'm, so, so for that, you can make, for example, like um, S&P. Yeah, that's simple. You could do it uh, for um, sector. I'm going to show it to you also in a minute. But you can just simply look at the S&P. And you uh, compare for every stock. What is the difference between the market sentiment and your stock sentiment? Yeah, so you do it just by, uh, you can do it in all sorts of simple ways. So you can <coughs> run uh, regression. So I'm going to show it to you. So as you can imagine, so the stock specific sentiment, so this is, po uh, this sentiment what we call is net positive. So it's positive score minus negative. So clearly it's the, it's a positive and very significant relationship. So there is no um, surprise about it. But what is interesting, though, is that when you include the market sentiment, this uh, uh, coefficient becomes bigger and even more significant, but it also becomes negative. So it's the discrepancy, indeed, between the market-specific, market-wide and stock-specific sentiment that you can then, um, how do you say, uh, utilize in your in your strategies yeah and another interesting thing is that it's very different per different kinds of stocks so for example small stocks are more sensitive to sentiment than big stocks this doesn't matter and highly volatile stocks are more sensitive to news than low volatile stocks see so these are the the famous sort of factors you know ball factor and size factor and so on and uh, within those factor compositions, the sensitivity to news is, is, is different. Also, what is different is that, for example, if the, yeah, so this is just the sentiment of the stock itself, but the same picture is basically holds for this uh, combination term. Yeah, so that's just pretty much in, in line with this, with this finding. Okay, so you can look at different sectors, and we will be inspired by that later on. So liquidity, yeah, that's another interesting thing. So what happens to liquidity when there is news? Again, it, so this is, for example, a very liquid stock. That's their news volume. This is less liquid stock. And look at the left-hand side. Uh, so here, this is weekly data. So here you would have 200, 250 sometimes uh, messages. Um, per week, and here you can see that uh, for for this, you rarely have two more than two per week, or sometimes you have none. So obviously, something is also very um, uh, specific about these categories, right? So how much volume is there? So these are the pictures, uh, sort of on general. So the spread. Uh, increases around this news event and also the trade size increases so that the, the, the activity in the market increases but where does it come from and it turns out that it comes from from these guys from the from those stocks about which a lot is written so these are the top top 20 liquid stocks out of S&P and the top 20%, and this is bottom 10%. Just. And pretty much all the significant increases of these liquidity characteristics come, which we observe here, sort of across the board, basically all come from the liquid stocks. Yeah? So if you want to optimize your order execution, you should look at sentiment, but only for stocks which are very, very liquid. So that's where 
there is a significant relationship between, let's say, other book depth and mm -hmm. things like that, but not in the stock square. Uh, a silly question that I yeah. see from the figures is that uh, um, if you have uh, liquid stocks and non-liquid stocks... Well, uh, they are all pretty liquid. Sorry? They are all pretty liquid. They are all members of the S&P 500. It's yeah, just... If, it's if, not if, if, if you take in that group, uh, mm -hmm. uh, have you analyzed if there is like... Um, how should I phrase this? Like, uh, uh, percent-wise... Uh, yeah, the good question. Yes, so that's a very good question. You can do it in two ways. One is on the basis of how much news there is, and one is on the basis of how much trading there is. Yes? So there are two classification possible. And it turns out that these two rankings, that if you do ranking on the basis of one or the other, they coincide. They're pretty much, they are very much, very, very much coincide. So they, they behave similarly? Uh, yes, if you rank according to volume of news, or if you rank according to volume of trade, it will be similar. So you can basically like uh, like uh, generate liquidity by 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 releasing suitable news. Yeah, but you would have to do it in a very long and consistent fashion. <laughs> you know, like you yeah, have to bombard. If you're you're permitted to do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is nice. This is uh, quite recent. So now we thought, okay, machine learning is very, of course, uh, big now. And it's, I think it's a consensus by now that learning from the data, from the, its own past history, is nonsense. It's never going to work. Simple as that. You need to be able to learn about price patterns. You need to add external information into your network in the neural networks. There is impossible, this whole sort of pattern recognition does not work. It's clear as anything. And people add, for example, other book information, right? Again, like when you model activity, you uh, proxy it by volume. So when you model external information, you proxy it by other book composition. But of course, where it comes from, where we just saw, it comes from the news, right? So why not proxy our learning algorithms by news flow, right? And let the neural network decide what's important and what's relevant. So that's what we did. So deep learning, uh, long short term memory uh, network uh, we trained. This one is on the Eurostox 50. So we, on the uh, quant minds, we heard a talk by a professor from Imperial, Rama Kont who said, um, you have to throw everything in one big pile. And when I heard that, I thought, yes, because that's exactly what I thought we should do here. And that was before he said it. So I was like, OK, my intuition is you know, confirmed by somebody I respect. So what we did for 50 stocks, we put it in one network. We don't train it per stock. We don't separate them in any way. We train it all together, which makes the amount of data 50 times as much, right? So uh, if you do FTSE, it's 100 times as much as you do S&P, it's uh, 500 times as much. So you can learn a lot more from that data. And also that, of course, you average out the response to news. But these are pretty big stocks. So, you know, this, they would probably react in a similar fashion. And these are the... And these are basically the, the algorithm results. So for example, uh, this is the benchmark. So this is the benchmark simple new network which is trained without external information. Yeah? And here we progressively add complexity into the network. And you see that, uh, yeah, it actually works. It does learn. So how does it learn? What does it learn? Well, what, you, what it learns, it learns to recognize the price moves. You, it, it's a classification algorithm, up or down, right? Simple as that. And um, what is interesting is that it learns downside much better. And we see it so much across the board, you know, with all the trading strategies. If you include the sentiment as the exit, variable, right, or something which 
protects you from the downside, that's where it actually is quite powerful. And that's exactly the same here. So, um, so these are all in, not actual predictions, but in uh, this times a thousand. Right, so we have not much time, but I still want to talk to you about some very, very exciting and completely different application of sentiment. And that is measuring what we call systemic risk in the financial system. Systemic risk is the risk associated not to one financial institution, but to financial system as a whole, right? So instability of financial system. And um, usually it's done by <coughs> looking at, let's say, hard measures, sort of aggregated capital buffer of banks, uh, total volatility in the market, VIGs, you know, LIBOR OIS spread, which is the measure of trust uh, of banks in each other. <laughs> but what we argued, we, we were sit sitting about and thinking, you know, with my research uh, students, you know, listening to all these uh, systemic risk lectures, thinking, but, you know, we have this data, we have this sentiment data about everything, right? And we think that perception, just like with a bank run, about financial institutions is just as important, or perhaps even more important, than the actual hard facts. So we thought, okay, what we're gonna do, we're gonna quantify this perception by simply monitoring media sentiment about big banks, CFIs, systemically important financial institutions, so Goldman's and J.P. Morgan's of, and Deutsche, of, so you guys, of this world. Right, and uh, so we, we devised a new measure of systemic risk which we called sensor. It's sentiment-based systemic risk. So I like the name, sentiment systemic risk. Yeah, we actually, over a beer, came up with it. So that's nice. So it's a quantitative measure of how the financial system is perceived in the media, so how positive or negative the media is. And, um, so important thing here is, so, so what are the innovative elements? And these are the elements which we sort of gathered from the previous research. Remember I told you we figured out this way of aggregating data when we still worked with commodities because we have this huge flow of very noisy sentiment scores there. So we need somehow aggregate it, denoise it, and so on. So we came up with this model, which we called local sentiment model, and I'm gonna show it to you. And it turned out it's extremely well applicable here also, because once you look at news, not about just one bank, but about 50 plus banks, it's a lot of news. It's almost as head news heavy as, let's say, crude oil. So thousands of news items about CFIs, which we actually augmented about our own uh, list, uh, are scored. So this is, this is important. The sentiment are filtered, and I'm going to show you how we denoise it. Novel and relevant news get highest weighting, and then another crucial element is that we can combine sentiment with the measures of the bank. Let's say how um, how in depth it is, yeah, which makes it more systemically uh, dangerous, right? Or how, how much leverage it has. That leverage is, of course, remember the Lehman leverage before it collapsed. Um, so, and then we aggregate it across all the CFIs. So let me point out just one thing, and that is the sentiment uh, model. So we, what we basically postulate, we say the actual sentiment in the market, we do not observe. We observe it with noise. So the sentiment that we observe is the measurement of the actual underlying sentiment with quite a significant degree of noise. But the sentiment itself evolves as a random walk because we don't know anything better, right? We, that's our best guess. And then we filter out the unobserved sentiment by means of Kalman filter. And we adjust the Kalman gain, uh, which is the basically signal to noise ratio, so the ratio between these two quantities, to um, fit our problem. Like if we want daily trading or if we want high frequency trading, we decrease, so we do not want very smooth signal. If we look at systemic risk, we need this long trends. So we adjust our Kalman gain accordingly to our application, right? Or we can estimate it by maximum likelihood, but 
then you so this is basically what it looks like. See, this is the weakly aggregated sentiment for HSBC, and this is the filtered signal. See, it's, it's, it becomes much more smooth, and it actually already starts reflecting some patterns. I'm going to show you example for one more stocks, which is very very funny. So basically, what we get here, so the green line is the neutral sentiment. This is uh, positive and this is negative. So here is the crisis and obviously negative becomes bigger and positive becomes smaller. This is a very interesting example, which is actually not financial institution, but I just thought I will show it anyway. It's the Exxon, Exxon Mobile. And interestingly enough, so at when, remember when the oil prices went down, not only positive sentiment went down, but also negative sentiment went down, and neutral sentiment prevailed. But of course, looking at the picture like this, it's very difficult to see that pattern. So that's actually very interesting, because we can use that, this now, for example, of comparing this company to its peers. And that's what we actually did for energy firms. So for many of them, for most of them, their positive sentiment went down, and their negative sentiment went up. They considered to have a huge beta with respect to oil price, so things aren't going very well. And Exxon was the one that actually stood <coughs> up quite a lot by not increasing negative sentiment very much. So that there is something that they must be doing right, being less sensitive to oil price or having something in there. And actually, this is confirmed also with their share price uh, relative to the industry pairs. Peers. Sorry. So the raw data on the left, is it? Uh the it's not even raw, it's averaged over a, average week. Over a week. Yeah, yeah. and already, and still then you have this huge amount of noise. So this is averaged over all articles of news about that stock. Exactly. About a week. Okay. And even then you see this. Okay. So then we thought, okay, we, we need to take it a step further because we can't work with this. The noise is so much that no matter what statistical analysis you throw at it, it will be insignificant. Anyway, so this is the sensor. This is our sensor, and here it's until, um, I think, in 2016. And that's nice. I, I really like this. Uh, so these are four versions, weighted by uh, market value, by debt, by leverage. So my favorite is uh, probably this, so debt, I think, or leverage. Yeah? So you see, it starts climbing, you know, in 2007, and reaches its peak. This is called the collapse of Lehman. What is also interesting is that perception about global financial system was even worse. So high is negative here. Uh, is worse during sovereign debt crisis. That was seen by media as even bigger source of risk than the actual financial crisis. So you can argue why that had lost, maybe because they were scared here and not reacted there, or because they truly thought it was a more uh, sort of significant event. So what does it look now? Now it looks very, very rosy. See, the, the perception about, the, so this is, I, I think it's a couple of months ago. So the perception about financial system now is very positive and very rosy. Whether it's a correct assessment or not, I do not know. But that's how it is right now. So what you could do, you could monitor financial institutions in different uh, areas. You could do it separately for the United States or for Europe or for Asia. What you could also do, you can compare this with the hard indicators. You can compare it with, to VIX or to LIBOR OIS spread. But the most importantly, you can compare it to a systemic risk indicator, which is called S-Risk. Maybe you know about it. It's the indicator developed by Bob Engel. Nobel Prize winner. And that combines hard information about banks, how much debt they have, what their holdings are, what their buffers. So it's very, very intensive exercise to come up with this, with this measure, with this S-risk measure. And this is our measure. And what is interesting is you see that it precedes, it precedes the hard measure, and it precedes it by approximately 12 weeks. So 12 weeks is the, seems to be a magic number. And why? Anybody knows? What's 12 weeks? Quarter. It's a quarter. Yeah. It's a quarterly results are released, and that's when the, this information seeps into this measure while it's already in the sentiment. So that's, that's awesome. And you could actually statistically test it. So 
uh, it has effect on GDP, on unemployment, and so on. But now I, I'm, this is really cool. So, 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 so now we can actually see who is the important guy in this bunch of sciences, CFIs, from whom the negative sentiment comes. How much they, these guys are mentioned together, you know, what, how this talk spreads, you know, in relationship to these financial institutions. So we can build network, we can build perceived networks of the financial system. For example, we can look whether they are mentioned in the same article. We can look whether they are mentioned in linked articles, because we can pull the link of every story completely to its very, very beginning or within a certain time interval. So this is what these networks looked like before the crisis. So see, very rare institutions were mentioned together or within the same time span. Uh, the size of the ball, I think, is the total mention of that particular CIFI, and the color is the region. Now, this is what it looks like during the crisis. Need I say more, right? So, so this is this is uh, the connectivity of network grows immensely, right? They are the, the talk about them is happening in linkages. So that's nice because you could also you could simply calculate. It's called average network degree. You can calculate it and you can monitor it. And you see, it also kind of gives you this uh, systemic risk pattern of increasing uh, distress. But what is really great is that you can, because it's public information, if we look at, let's say, institutional holdings, like who's holding assets of which bank and how they are related with all sorts of derivatives content, usually that's all proprietary data. We cannot, we say, this bank has a lot of dealings with this bank, but we don't know what they are. Well, here we know what they are. We They are in the news, right? So we can rank them by what is the source of sentiment? So what is the most, uh, let's say, a bank that is uh, most uh, generates the negative sentiment, let's say, yeah? So this is averaged over many uh, years, and you cannot see it here, but I have it on the next list. So, um, so the Citigroup uh, is, for example, so this, uh, this is the ranking, and this is how the centrality of these banks changed through time from 2000, let's say, six until now. So for example, you can see that although Citigroup used to be uh, seen as like very central and very important systemically, it dropped in the ranking. This remained unchanged, this dropped, this uh, increased. And what you can also see that uh, UK banks, since the Brexit, seem to be a big source of negative sentiment. See HSBC, Barclays, Royal Bank of Scotland, they went up in the ranking of how they generate this negative sentiment in the system. So this is, the, I think this is, this is very interesting. Right, so you can weight sensor by centrality, you can uh, devise your sensor purely on the basis of network, and again the magic number of 12 weeks is present, omnipresent in all these, in all these pictures. So this you take financial institutions, you monitor sentiment about them. Why not do it for other industries, right? Why not take energy companies, tech, and do exactly the same? So let's do it. So do, do exactly the same and see what it looks like. So these are the industry uh, sentiments. So this is energy. And interesting to notice is that you see this huge drop of sentiment completely in the negative territory, but uh, it recovered pretty much. And nobody is saying bad things about them anymore. This is our sensor, so this is the, uh, so there are tech, telecom. Uh, this is, you see, huge discrepancy. So tech companies always rise in price, right? Well, the sentiment about them is actually not uh, confirming this trend. Yeah. So again, why worries about Asia, China, perhaps we don't know. But anyway, so now the question is: you can do this, and you can have 
very different uh, ways of looking at this picture. But it's not obviously clear that there is a huge relationship. So here, okay, so here you see there is a relationship of sentiment and the price. Although here it's completely opposite. So, so there, is, there, is, there is a non-trivial relationship, if, if any. So, 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 so what turns out is that the role of sentiment is very different in different market circumstances. So in, if market is very bullish um, or very bearish, so that, that is very much determines of how people react to sentiment. If prices are going up and up and up, people tend to ignore even negative news, right? Because they have this confirmation bias, right, from behavioral facts. While when prices are going down, then we pay extra attention to what's written and so on and so forth. And you can actually um, see it here. So this is the effect of sentiment for different regimes uh, in the market. So this is when returns are negative, so when market going down, and this is when market going up. And this, you see, is exactly the relationship that you think it should be, sentiment positive, prices up, sentiment negative, prices down. But that only happens in the trending markets which are trending down. And when they're trading up, it's usually not even significant what sentiment is. People just buy no matter what. Okay, so that's another interesting thing to do. So why not rotate s sectors according to that signal? And again, very simple, same, same principle. It's the downside we want to avoid, and the downside you can capture with sentiment. So clearly this is the way we should go then, right? If, we, if that's what we observe. So our buy, buy signal is the moving average crossover, and our sell signal is the sentiment. Yeah. See how that plays out. It plays out very well. So this is the, the benchmark, and this is this rotation strategy. See, they... they they kind of hand in hand. What is difficult to see, and which will become clear in the uh, table, is that, okay, this, uh, this is a lot of weeks, you know. The volatility of this signal is much lower than volatility of that. And that's what you can actually, oh yeah, so here is the same picture. So this is, you actually observe even more if you rebalance monthly. So what do, you, what do we get? We get um, we get the same return, pretty much, not much difference, but we have three times or half the volatility. Why? Because we get out on time. We avoid large drawdowns, and you can actually see it in the size of maximum drawdowns. See? So return you do not generate in this way because you buy on the normal sort of what everybody does. But you sell, you exit the position rather, when there is a sentiment signal tells you to do so. Because remember, it precedes the actual development by a long time, by, by se definitely by several weeks. Right. Some summary, complex relationship, million of different things you can do with it. You can monitor credit quality, for example, of companies by looking at the sentiment. You can monitor, you can predict credit spreads. Yeah, there is a significant relationship between credit spreads and, uh, and sentiment, and especially for smaller companies, again. Um, you can assess performance of particular firm in relationship to its peers in terms of how they're managing sentiment. So it's completely non-financial as an application. So what I also know that uh, company do, because I consulted a few, is that they time their announcements to the sentiment. So they uh, wait, like if they have the, some bad news to break, like uh, product recall, they wait for the market or the peer sentiment to turn, and that's when they announce it, if they are not by law required to do so within a certain period of time. So that's an interesting application, I think. Right. So 
interesting thing from the perspective, oh, by the way, the sensor is now used by uh, central banks and regulators. It's, um, we're still in the discussion with Thomson Reuters to put it on the icon. Um, will take them ages. But it's used, so, so that's nice. So it seems that the wisdom of crowds, or rather collective view of the media, is a better indicator of financial distress, and sometimes a cause of it, uh, than fact-based measures. One thing which we can actually improve on it, it, it people would ask me, uh, what about social media? Well, social media, Twitter, has a lot of junk in it. So the sentiment of that is very, even if you try to smooth it, it comes out to nothing. There is one aspect of social media, however, which helps us to improve these things, and that is called buzz. So that's the only measure which I observed in terms of social media which improves news-based measures. And the buzz is simply the volume of talk about a particular company or a bunch of, bunch of companies. So if you enhance your signals with the buzz, News can be very positive, but if nobody is talking about it, then you have a problem. So it's a combination then of the sentiment and buzz that makes things you know, work even better. So things do not pass for what they are, but for what they seem. right? And the sentiment measures tell us exactly how things seem, rather than how they maybe really are. But I don't care. Right, <laughs> so um, I could talk about it for hours, and I will stop here. Um, yeah, feel free to get in touch. All my papers are on uh, SSRN research gates. I regularly give webinars, so you can uh, listen to them in recording um, on many of these kind of topics. So interesting issue which we are embarking on now is combining this whole sentiment story with ESG, with sustainability. So to look at whether, let's say, sus companies which have sustainable high scores are better perceived in the media, how they manage their controversies uh, in terms of sustainability and so on. So what we're basically now embarking on is to try to enhance the entire sort of ESG space with the sentiment. So how to assess whether a company really is sustainable or is just greening itself in the yearly report. So that's one of the new uh, areas we are just about to uh, begin with. So I will uh, report on that shortly. Thank you. Take a couple of questions and have a beer then? Yes, sorry, sorry. Just uh, getting violent, sorry. Are there any questions? <laughs> uh, so what's your best model for uh, uh, getting a sentiment score? How do you mean? I get sentiment scores from News Analytics Engine. I do okay, not do process not text, it. no, no. The, the most thing I would do is if I'm not sure about something or where I want to, to have an aspect which is not directly scored, I would look at the headlines. But the, uh, the sentiment engine is actually very, very sophisticated. It's a company which called, is called Lexalytics, uh, which uh, was a spin-off, I think, from Harvard, right? They, uh, I don't know. I think they are from Harvard University. And they developed this engine. With, and now it's considered to be pretty much you know, top of the pack in terms of how well it scores uh, for sentiment. So it's widely sort of said that the scoring for at least companies is the same as a human would do. And for commodities, a little bit lower, but they are improving all the time. But that's what I mean. You know, you shouldn't buy. When I, when I come to somebody wants to talk to me about it, uh, client, or, and they say, yeah, you know, we have to pay for it. We will write our own new sentiment uh, interpretation engine. I'm like, good luck to you. <laughs> I wouldn't trust that. So you mentioned uh, the, the films from Reuters, you mentioned Ravenback and, and, and some others there. Bloomberg, yeah. Uh, have you been using all of them in your research? I only looked at uh, Ravenback and Thomson Reuters. I, because Thomson Reuters and Bloomberg are not friends, mm -hmm. I will not be able to touch Bloomberg data. 
but Ragnpak and Reuters I used both. Yes. And uh, yeah, the, the Ragnpak has, has things that Thomson Reuters, for example, doesn't have, like country sentiment or uh, currency specific things, which Reuters doesn't have. So, so it's, it's yeah. So but your recommendation is to use several and combine the best of both and... and no, I think it depends on what you want. I mean, seriously, with this stuff, what you get from Thomson Reuters, they are con all the time complain that they don't sell enough of it and blah. And of course they don't, because it's so difficult to process. It's, imagine the size of it. And it's just, it's, if, if, they, if it's a non-sophisticated company, they simply have no capabilities of processing. <coughs> So they really have to put analytics on top of that, in my opinion. But it's a, it, they don't see it as their core business. So I think it's, it's, you can use it for social sciences for sure. It's just that it's not my area. You mentioned uh, deep learning applied to... Yeah, that is, I think, very exciting. Yeah, because you said at some point that deep learning or LTSM applied to stock price um, that we only will not, will not uh, use anything. Uh, is there any reason why? Have you tried? Or? Yeah, that was the yellow line. So and then we tried it many times on different universes of stocks. It's, w it's, you could just as well basically throw a coin. It's just too noisy, right? Yeah. Okay. No, it's just simply you cannot learn anything. It's like sitting and observing fruit machine. Do you know what, the, do you know what I mean by fruit machine? The one, the slot, slot machine. You can sit and observe it and try to recognize patterns of that. And then you do it again and something else comes up. And this is exactly what you see in the markets. You need to know the physics of that machine at that particular point, which in my case is the, is the news flow. So in your case, you had actually, how did you implement it? You had two factors, one was the stock return, the other one was the news sentiment? Yes. And it's deep learning, so it's yeah, feeding it's on itself. Yeah, so I take all the previous history and the sentiment, and the sentiment history. Okay, so it's basically two factors. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thanks. In, in the graphs you have the returns, what, what were you using as training? Like, where was out of sample, where was in sample? Yeah, we trained it on the one and a half years of data, and then we tested it on another one and a half years. And that's actually including BDASK spread. So it's not me to quote. So we yeah. actually trade on uh, correct yeah. uh, uh, ends of bid ask spreads. But sorry, I'm still a bit confused because so you say um, two factors sentiment at stock price is is giving something. It's giving direction. Yeah, but uh, is it better than having only uh, sentiment? Oh, well, that we haven't tried. Uh, because the, you say the stock price was giving nothing, and then two factors was giving something, but we don't know if. Which one? No, yeah, we don't right, know. Okay, okay. Maybe it's a combination. There are all sorts of non-linearities, of course, in such a network. Yeah. And it's like when price went up and the sentiment was up and then it curved. Do you know uh, what I mean? Yes. Like there is a, I think there is an interaction effect. Right, okay. But I haven't tried only sentiment, no. Okay, present. With a deep learning, throw everything at it and see <laughs> what happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think if there are further questions, we, we can take them during the beer, exactly. And we can go to the bar as well we, once we finish this beer. Um, <laughs> so the bar is downstairs. So I would like to thank... Invitation. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. I think it was extremely exciting for people. I think people very much enjoyed it. They're nodding, which is good. And they're not nodding off, they're literally nodding in agreement. <laughs> and, it's, and it's very good. I think it's a very positive thing. Not a single person is nodding off, which is great to see, especially at this hour. Um, so they're all excited, you know, which is, I think, great. And smiling, and, uh, you know, which, is, which is good news. So I, I, I think two announcements. So some of you guys came to our... So, in fact, a student of mine from Imperial College, she just went out, I think, when she saw me sort of, you know, come, come here. I mean, I think she, yeah, this is, this is, she just ran away. But I was just, uh, and, you know, some of you came to my Imperial College course on machine learning, uh, and we did some workshops in machine learning, and we're now planning to, to maybe do either a workshop or more likely a summer school for a full week at Oxford, somewhere in a nice college. Um, um, you know, uh, maybe dedicate to 
to, to machine learning. And I hope this works out because how many of you or how many of you have people who would in principle be interested in going for a full one week course in machine learning? Yeah, I might for sure. So if you guys are interested and you know, and we kind of really teach them, uh, you know, in uh, very, very seriously. We kind of teach very serious stuff because we're very, you know, we are very, very keen on sort of teaching people. Way. The other thing that um, the other thing that I want to I mean it's probably going to happen towards the end of the summer. The other thing that people have probably you know people who kind of know me well, I mean despite the fact that I seem cheerful most of the time, I'm actually depressed all the time. I've been rethinking, if you like, the philosophy. I think what what we've been really going through uh, in the world. I think is, is you know we have this very exciting thing, machine learning, which is uh, you know which is really coming on board. But at the same time, if we look at what's happening politically in the world, right, there is a crisis of ideologies. Right, because all the ideologists that we have known, right, socialists, conservative, liberal ideologists, are going through a massive crisis. Right, so now that we are kind of developing this weaponry, if you like, scientific weaponry, I think I think what what is actually very important is is you know the Talesians, you know, are about you know this guy who is by the way a migrant, he is actually a Venetian <laughs> who came from um, you know and uh, you know and that's I didn't I didn't really put a migrant there just by accident, right? So he came from Phoenicia. He was ostracized with a fellow, with a fellow, um, with, with, with a fellow right. countryman. And he had to go to, to um, he had to go to, to Greece, right? But that's not where he comes from. Um, and, um, you know, and Thales was, if you like, the founder of philosophy, right? So, I mean, what, what, what I think happened in philosophy after Thales some of it is beautiful, but I think overall we can describe it, you know, if we look at the history of mankind, you know, which is un the underlying sort of basis of this is philosophy, starting from, you know, that this is my student who ran away as soon as I came here. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, um, you know, I think, I think it's pretty terrible, right, if we, if we look at how the world actually is, right, I think it's pretty terrible. So Talis, I think the reason we go to Talis is to go back to first principles, right, it's an opportunity to kind of rework philosophy. And uh, I, will, I will be giving a Thalesian talk because we, we have been hearing this thing, transhumanism, right? And some people take this kind of negative view of transhumanism, right? But I think that if we really look at where philosophy is right now and what we need for machine learning to really work and what we need for the world to become a better place, we need to probably go back to Thales and rebuild um, the philosophical foundations. Right, because if we kind of look carefully through some of the work by Nietzsche, for example, we can recognize how, you know, some of this philosophy was used in pretty, you know, terrible ways, say, in World War II, for instance. We can see how some of the philosophical ideas that were developed, if you like, on the foundation laid by the Greeks uh, led to disastrous consequences. So we actually want to rethink philosophy, and we, at some point, will kind of, kind of give a talk on what we regard as the truly Thalesian philosophy, what we regard as Thalesian political philosophy, and what we regard as Thalesian philosophy of machine learning. So this will be coming up, and um, hopefully this will be quite interesting. Um, and um, yes, and hopefully, if we can come up with better philosophy, we can hopefully build a better world. So thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Svetlana. We are really honored to have you here. Thank, thank you. you very much.